It's like looking at the gateway to hell, said one Q80. Literally from horizon to horizon, you can see smoke and fires. One of the worst disasters I've ever seen. It's what we normally deal with. We just don't ever have five or 600 in a, in a row to work on. We just have to be careful, make sure we have the right plan when we attack the well. And we'll take them one at a time, just like we did this well here. Now, where do you go from here? We go right down the road to the next one. In February 1991, after the failed invasion of Kuwait, the retreating Iraqi army sabotaged more than 700 oil wells. The resulting fires stained the blue desert skies black, turning day into night with the thick, soot-saturated smoke appearing like streaks of ink across the planet from space. An ecological and economic disaster. With a practically endless supply of fuel, the fires could have raged for 45 years without intervention and conditions were worsening with every passing moment. An estimated 5 to 6 million barrels of oil were lost to the fires for every single day they raged. With a per barrel cost of around $18, the Kuwait government was hemorrhaging a million dollars every 13 to 16 minutes. Putting out a single oil well fire is a challenge, but the situation in Kuwait would put firefighting experts to their limits. The teams would need to navigate unexploded ordnance littered in the war-torn deserts. And not all of the oil erupting from the ground was being burnt by the gigantic 90 meter tall flames. Lakes of toxic oil quickly began to form around the flames, which could catch light at any moment, making the firefighting operation even more dangerous. This was one of the most complex firefighting operations ever undertaken. Kuwait is estimated to have spent $25 billion paying firefighters and oil and gas workers to stem the flow of their precious oil. These fires and the payday that was up for grabs ignited a race between expert firefighting teams from all over the world. The veteran Texas oil men gathered in this hotel said they'll need hundreds of workmen and it'll take at least a year to put out the fires. The cost, a billion pounds, and that's before any accounting is made of the environmental price tag. However, one team of 23 Hungarians arrived with a machine like no other. A custom-built firefighting vehicle, a tank retrofitted with two massive jet engines, an incredible machine that played one part in the massive firefighting operation. In 1988, Iraq emerged from an eight-year war with Iran, bruised, battered, and economically crippled. Unable to pay its debts, it campaigned for OPEC to increase the price of oil, a move that would help Iraq pay off its war debts. However, Iraq claimed Kuwait had done just the opposite, surpassing its production quotas, causing oil prices to drop. And in August 1990, Iraq began its conquest of Kuwait. However, following a six-month-long counter-offensive by the US and its allies, Iraq's quest to claim Kuwait's oil for itself came to an end. But their mission to increase oil prices was not over. As they retreated, they sabotaged Kuwait's oil production. In a few short days, Iraq destroyed 85% of Kuwait's oil wells. Early damage control efforts had nothing to do with the fires. Half buried in the sand, unexploded bombs. Around each well, there may be mines and booby traps. All will have to be cleared before the work can start putting out the fires. For almost a month, the 700 fires roared without attention while the fields were cleared. The military began clearing the way using explosive-laden wires, clearing paths to the wells. However, if there was oil on the ground, these explosives could not be used, and the mines were instead buried with sand to create a safe passageway. By the end of the first year, more than a million mines and 600 tons of unexploded munitions had been cleared. Fighting fires in a desert comes with a logistical challenge. There's no water. First off, we're gonna need massive amounts of water. Once we get the water in to where we can cool area and get in close to it, then we can start trying to remove the damaged wellhead or possibly even put the fires out. You could stay there all day long as long as you have the water. In the absence of the water, you couldn't stay there for a second. In order to fight the fires, the teams needed to pump millions of gallons of water from the sea. 
By using the existing pipelines, the firefighters had access to 25 million gallons of seawater every day, with the water being pumped into hundreds of man-made lagoons. But getting close enough to the fires to not only spray this water accurately, but to fix the damaged oil infrastructure was proving a massive challenge. Hardened carbon-rich mounds formed from cooked oil were forming volcano-like formations around the well heads, blocking access to the infrastructure that needed to be repaired or plugged to stop the flow of oil. With flames too close to the mounds to safely clear the way, the engineers and firefighters on the ground needed a solution. One solution was to lower long steel tubes with a crane onto the well head, which allowed the flame to be raised off the ground and allowed teams to get close enough to remove the mounds and begin starving the flame of heat. Another method was to starve the fires of oxygen using explosives. Teams were stuffing empty oil drums with plastic explosives and slowly maneuvering them over the flames, where it would explode and consume so much oxygen in the surrounding air that the flames would be snuffed out. But what would you rather do? Slowly inch closer to a blazing fire surrounded by lakes of oil, with toxic oil raining down from above with kilograms of explosives. Or roll up to the fire in an armored tank with two jet engines adapted to become the world's most powerful water cannons. A team of 23 Hungarian firefighters showed up with just that, nicknamed Big Wind. They removed the turret from an old Soviet T-62 tank and replaced it with two jet engines from the MiG-21. To prevent desert sand, debris, tools, birds or even firefighters from being sucked into the air intakes, large fence boxes were placed in front of them. The driver entered the tank from a small hatch nestled between the two massive jet engines. The already cramped space needed to be adapted to fit two tanks of compressed air to allow the driver to survive the toxic fumes surrounding the fires. And with visibility inside the tank basically being non-existent, and with two jet engines less than a meter away from each of their ears, communication with the driver was extremely limited. They were directed by the Commander Chief's joystick that would light up two simple green and red lights that would direct the driver where to point the tank. Above the driver and outside the tank, the engine operator sat on a platform, controlling the thrust of the engines. Once given the all clear, the crew would position the tank just eight meters away from the fire. Protected by a transparent heat shield, the operator would start the engines, which guzzled half a gallon of fuel every second and generated 120 kilonewtons of thrust. From this position, the operator could see the three water nozzles that sprayed 3,780 liters of water every minute directly into the exhaust of the engines. The machine was purpose-built to put out oil fires. With an endless supply of fuel erupting from the ground and the ground so hot that it would reignite any fuel that touched it, putting out the flame alone was not enough. The firefighters needed a way to cut the fuel off from the flame and to rapidly cool the surrounding area. The extreme blast of air and water would hit the column of gushing oil with so much force that it would cut straight through it, robbing the flame of more fuel, and the immense volume of water would remove enough heat to ensure the flame could not restart. The thrust of the engines also had enough power to dislodge the hardened carbon buildup around the wellhead too. However, the engines were designed to intake frigid air in the upper atmosphere, not the hot, dense desert air. This limited the machine to 20-minute blasts to prevent overheating. But even with the 20-minute limit, the Hungarian team blew away expectations. To extinguish the fire, the team only needed 12 to 40 seconds, compared to the hours it took using traditional methods. Putting out the flame was just step one of the process, however. The flow of oil still needed to be stopped. In Kuwait, most wells extract oil from reservoirs located between 120 and 2,100 meters beneath the ground. These reservoirs contain not only oil, but also seawater and natural gas, compressed to 7,000 psi. When the well is tapped, these gases and liquids will flow uncontrollably outwards, driven by that pressure. An oil well is designed to safely transport these precious commodities to the surface. The boreholes are lined with steel casings and concrete to resist the pressure, 
and to prevent the oil from filtering into the earth on its way up. And the top of these steel pipes are topped with something nicknamed a Christmas tree, containing pressure gauges and control valves. This Christmas tree is what the Iraqi army targeted and destroyed. While the majority of the wells they targeted were successfully destroyed, some remained intact, showing us how they were destroyed. We found just one that wasn't. Following these detonator wires to a single wellhead, it had been packed with explosives by Saddam's troops. The plastic explosive lying in sandbags underneath. For some reason, it hadn't gone off. Just another hazard facing the oil firefighters before their job begins. In some fortunate cases, the top broke off cleanly, ejecting the oil straight up. The clean break provided a steady flow of oil that burned effectively and steadily. These were easier to fight, as the wellhead was easier to see, reach, and block. However, the majority of the wells did not have a clean cut. Partially destroyed trees sent oil flying in random directions and cracks in the piping led to oozing oil that collected, cooked, and hardened around the well. Once the fires were quenched, the teams could move in to cap the well. If there was minimal destruction and the pipes still held their overall circular shape, the teams move forward with a device called a stinger. A stinger is a tapered attachment that is inserted into the well opening while oil still flows, sometimes even while it was still ablaze. This attachment was affixed to the end of a crane, and kill mud was pumped through to control the flow. Kill mud is made using regular drilling mud, or it's something called kill weight mud, made from dense substances like barite and hematite. On-site calculations based on the flow rate and the pressure of the well dictated how much of this material was needed to exceed the hydrostatic pressure of the well to block the flow of oil. For wells with irregular openings, larger grained mud was needed to form a seal around the stinger. In some cases, the wells were too damaged for even this, and the structure needed to be cut away first. In total, it took more than 10,000 people to fight for over eight months to extinguish these fires. The Hungarian team actually arrived quite late to the scene. Three teams from Houston, Texas, and one from Canada were the first on the scene. They worked together with the Q80 firefighters for the first few months. However, the slow progress was frustrating the Q80 government, as they watched their entire economy erupt from the ground. So, by August 1991, more teams were invited. This is when Big Wind arrived at the scene. The three Texas crews capped a total of 357 wells between them, while the Canadian team capped 176. The Canadians brought their own specialized firefighting truck with its own supply of water, designed to use 90% less water with the help of dry firefighting chemicals. This allowed them to move quickly and efficiently in an environment where water was in short supply. The impressive looking big wind machine, in the end, arriving later on the scene and constrained by logistics, managed to cap just nine wells. The Q80 oil fires were one of the worst ecological disasters in the history of man. For comparison, the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster of 2010 spilled 205 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico and took almost a month to get under control. The Q8 oil fires caused the loss of 42 billion gallons of oil over eight months, an ecological disaster so immense that over a quarter of a million veterans of the war have been affected by its toxic effects with immeasurable effects on the world at large. The story of these firefighters is just one story of thousands that came as a result of the rule of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein ruled Iraq for nearly a quarter of a century, and throughout that time, he initiated two enormous wars that resulted in the death of millions, and the international coalition that formed to stop him was the biggest since the Second World War. The story of how this man changed the world around him is fascinating, and is the subject of this episode of Real Life Lore's Nebula exclusive series, Modern Conflicts. There are now 36 episodes of this series that you can't watch anywhere else. If you sign up today, you will even get early access to our upcoming Insane Engineering episode on the F-117 Nighthawk, which was used in the battle to reclaim Q8. Or you can watch our entire five-part Battle of Britain series, showing you in intricate detail 
how Britain strategized their most impactful victory of World War II. Nebula is full of exclusive content that you can't get on YouTube, along with our entire catalogue without any ads. You can also easily download videos to watch on the go. You can get all of this while directly supporting this channel for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Or if you are simply sick of signing up to yet another subscription service, we also offer a lifetime membership. For $300, you can have lifelong access to Nebula, which helps us fund exciting new originals which break the mould of what YouTube creators can make. Like the upcoming travel competition series, The Getaway, from the team behind Jetlag the Game. This channel depends on the funding Nebula provides us. If you've been subscribed to this channel for more than three years, you've seen the huge increases in production quality that Nebula has facilitated. Growing from simple 2D animations that myself and Mike taught ourselves how to do, to having a full team of incredibly talented 3D artists that rival any TV production. This is expensive work, and we would love to grow our team even more, something we can only do with your support, as YouTube ad revenue simply does not cover the bills. Last year we actually made a financial loss for three months in a row. YouTube is simply a volatile platform where we depend on the whims of advertisers. Nebula is our life raft in a volatile sea of social media. This is a common theme across YouTube creators. Nebula's goal is to enable and level up our entire roster of creators, to remove the financial uncertainty that forces us to rush projects, and to remove the algorithms that force us to analyze data points instead of what really matters the audience on the other side of the screen. So if you want to check out all of the fascinating exclusive content on Nebula, go to nebula.tv forward slash real engineering or click the link in the description to get 40% off our yearly subscription today for the incredibly low price of $250 a month for the whole year.